So after our preliminary discussion of uh, <coughs> rotating, uh, rotating masses and uh, gravitomagnetism, uh, let's look at uh, a more, uh, a more uh, interesting and challenging uh, subject, the case of rotating stars, black holes, and the Kerr metric. So, you know, we, we, we've seen the existence of a, of a black hole, a Schwarzschild a black hole, and now it's time to uh, look at a situation which is more realistic, okay, where the black hole uh, is, not, is not static and stationary, but actually carries angular momentum. That's the, uh, the Kerr metric, and since that's the situation that, that occurs in, uh, in astrophysics, this, uh, this study is very, very relevant to, uh, to the experimental side of the house, as well as to the theoretical side of the house. Okay, so let's so let's get there. First, we'll discuss generic uh, aspects of a metric that describes a rotating system, and then we'll look at the specifics of the of the solution of Roy Kerr, the uh, Kerr metric for a rotating uh, star. Okay, so uh, <coughs> so the Kerr metric is going to describe a space time outside of rotating uh, mass m with a fixed angular momentum j. It's a stationary uh, situation, just like the one we looked at earlier. It has no time dependence, and it's axisymmetric. So the system is rotating with a constant angular, uh, angular velocity. Uh, we'll, we'll use a spherical coordinates or Cartesian coordinates and uh, set up the metric that way. And so, uh, and so here's, uh, here's our expectation for those coordinates. Now remember with coordinates and general relativity, okay, the coordinates are actually an aspect of the solution, not an aspect of the input. Well, we can input them uh, with our prejudices coming from flat space, which in these solutions uh, is the space that's very far away from the source. But we, but we have to be open to surprises as we get uh, into the region of strong gravity where space-time is curved. Then we'll have to st study those uh, coordinates and, uh, and and try to understand what they what they mean in that, in that framework. So, okay, so so keep an eye out for that. Okay, okay. So well, here's a setup with standard uh, spherical coordinates. Okay, with uh, with with theta the polar angle, with phi the axial angle, and and the distance r from from the point. We'll be measuring the um, <coughs> the metric at a point r. Uh, and, and there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, a rotating uh, ball of mass here and with that angular momentum going in the z direction as shown there. <coughs> now, because of the symmetries, we know immediately that the, that the metric is going to have some, some simplicities about it. It has no dependence on t and no dependence upon phi. Okay, and so I, I know something about the dynamics coming from, from symmetries. It, we've seen it several times. We know that the, uh, the covariant uh, momentum four vector, we we'll call it E, it is uh, a constant of, uh, of the motion. Okay, if I put a particle out in this environment, its energy divide, uh, defined in that particular way is a constant. And we also know that the momentum in the phi direction, I call it minus L, of a test particle, are also conserved. So we'll keep that in mind, and we'll use that in various Ganonkin experiments before we look at the orbits in the vicinity of the rotating star. Okay, uh, G uh, alpha beta does depend upon x1 and x2, which might be r and theta, the other variables in the, in the problem. Okay, so let's take a look at generic metrics of this form, of this form first. Okay, uh, so the metric is, go is going, to have, going to have the form. Well, there'll be a, a dt squared a term with a GTT metric. There's, we're, we're describing rotation, and so we know full well that, uh, that there's going to be a term uh, coupling uh, T to the axial, axial angle phi. And so I, there's going to be a, a G sub T phi, uh, which is non-zero, and something that we're going to want to concentrate on. Okay, and then, and then in addition, there'll be a D phi squared term, a dr squared term, and a D theta squared term, and I just put uh, functions in front of them, and those will be uh, to be determined uh, from uh, Einstein field equations. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, the first thing I'd like to do, we did this in the case of the relativistic rotating uh, 
frame of reference, we wanted to diagonalize it. We wanted to clearly um, separate a, spa a spatial part, a space-like part, from a time-like part. And so I'll, I'll diagonalize th uh, this thing by completing the square. Uh, now, in the case of the rotating uh, reference frame, uh, it, was, it was a simple uh, situation because we were simply rotating in a, in, a, in a metric that we knew, the Minkowski metric. And so I could use the ideas of, of um, special relativity to guide me in doing the, uh, the uh, diagonalization. Uh, it was a question of applying the idea of relativity simultaneity. Uh, here, well, uh, I'll just do the algebra. Okay, that's, that's really uh, the, the appropriate thing because I might be far from the Minkowski metric. And so I just complete the square. And here's the result of, of, of doing that exercise, okay? So, so I have the metric in front of dt squared, which is this combination of, of the g's in my original statement. I have a term that mixes uh, the phi and the t, and this is, and this is the way uh, it, it goes, and then the other, the other terms are left, are left alone. Okay, uh, that's just the arithmetic. So, so, uh, <coughs> so just uh, multiply this term out, uh, add, it to, add it to this term, okay, and, uh, and, and, and see that we've done, we've done, we, we just uh, recapture this term right here. Okay, okay. Uh, along the way, let's, uh, we see our, our combination of d phi uh, plus something dt, and so it's tantalizing to define the ratio here with a minus sign as omega, because we, we remember for rotating reference frames, it was just the, ro the angular velocity of the rotating turntable in the Minkowski space. So let's, let's do that. It's going to prove to be profitable. And then I'll define a phi prime, which would be phi minus omega t, okay, as I would have done in the rotating turntable. And then if phi prime is held fixed, you see, then I have in this equation that omega is d phi by dt. So it's just the rate of rotation in this angular variable with respect to the time, the coordinate time in this, in this particular metric. Okay, so we'll, we'll keep that, we'll keep that in mind. Okay, okay, now uh, we're going to need, as we do the analysis, the, the contravariant components of the metric. Okay, so here's the metric. Well, for the metrics we've redone, like the Schwarzschild case, it was completely uh, diagonal, no mixing. All the G's were on diagonal, and so the inverse just told you to flip over the G's. Well, in this case, there's also a two by two matrix mixing T and phi, and so I have to diagonalize the two by two matrix as well. Well, that's easy to do, especially since the metric, the, the matrix mixing is, is, uh, is symmetric. Okay, the standard formulas for diagonalizing this two by two case, it's a metric matrix, I know I can always do it, et cetera, et cetera, and here you go. Okay, so here's GRR. Okay, that's just the reciprocal because there's no mixing. So also for theta theta. But for TT and T phi and phi phi, I have to diagonalize the, uh, uh, these, three, the, uh, these three terms, and here's the result of doing that. Capital D is the, is the uh, determinant of that two by two matrix, so it's written down, it's written down over here. Okay, <coughs> okay, and so, and here, here's G upper TT, here's the mixing between T and phi. Oh, and here I, I put in omega, okay, which is minus, uh, g t phi over g phi phi here just uh, just to clean up the uh, okay the um, formulas a little bit and then here's g phi phi okay so it's going to be some interesting phenomena here because of this mixing right I see that g upper t t is g lower phi phi and and similarly with phi phi and t t upper and lower okay so so interesting things are going to happen because of the mixing. And, uh, and I can go straight to that uh, here uh, by, by thinking, by trying to interpret the metric by doing a little experiment. Okay, and my little experiment will be to take a test particle outside the mass and drop it in. Okay, that's easy. So I consider a test, a test particle and I make its angular momentum zero. Okay, and then I want to see what happens to it as it falls toward the spinning mass, okay? Okay, so initially uh, uh, P sub phi, the angular momentum, is, is equal to zero. 
And now I want to look at my coordinates, my ordinary contravariant coordinates. Those are the ones, uh, <coughs> okay, that uh, that I use in, in measurements for the most part. And so that's why I generate my, my dynamics in, in the upper upper indices. Okay, and so uh, P phi, I have to raise, I have to raise the index. So I raise it with G phi mu, sum over mu. And then I, and then I look for non-zero components here. And I, the only case I get is when mu is equal to zero. Okay, so TT. And then if I want to, for example, uh, get P in with the, with a zero component, I call it T here. Then I have, I, then I need to look at G T mu, sum over mu with the lower component here to see how that's related to the covariant uh, coordinates. And, <coughs> uh, okay, and in, and in this particular case, okay, I'll, I'll sum over mu and I'll get, a, I'll get a contribution for mu equals zero. Well, you think I'll also get a, get a, a contribution for phi, uh, but I s took initial conditions, okay, that set that equal to zero, okay. So, so, so that's all I get there. So I find some interesting mixing in the phi and, and t direction, but only in one case because of my initial conditions, which are asymmetric like that. Okay, but now, of course, I know my, my momenta with, with in contravariant uh, 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 variables, okay, indices. It's just d by d tau of the, of the four vector velocity with upper indices, okay? Those are my, coordinate, my coordinates on the, on the mesh. And so, and so P up a T is, as usual, D T D tau, and P up a phi is D phi D tau. Okay, so, so these are the ones that refer to my coordinate mesh, and that's why I emphasize them here. Okay, so uh, one of the first things I do is I'll, I'll look at my, uh, my angular velocity in coordinates, okay? So that's this ratio, okay? And I look over here, and I see that that's the ratio of this fellow to this fellow, because the d tau's cancel out, okay? That's a good observation because that then lets me write the ratio in terms of the metric, okay? Which I which I do, which I've done. P up a phi is this mixing matrix with P T downstairs, and P T upstairs is G T T with P T downstairs. The P T's cancel, and I'm left just with that. And then I can and then I can look back. So I get my metric with contravariant indices, and I want to write it in terms of the metric with covariant indices. That's the original metric I wrote down, and that's what's done, that's what's done here. Okay, and it's complicated, but there's plenty of cancellation for an app, and it just reduces down to omega of r and theta. Okay, okay. So I see what omega of r and theta is. It's the angular momentum of a test particle with vanishing angular momentum in the, uh, in, in the z direction, okay? So it's the angular velocity of a test particle whose uh, angular momentum in the z direction is actually, is actually zero. Okay, so if, it, if, a, if a particle is, is dropped straight along a radial slope, it acquires a non-zero angular momentum, which is given by omega bar and theta, the ratio of these, of these two uh, uh, members of, of, of the metric which is non-zero. So in fact, we see an example of what we were calling in the last lecture, frame dragging, okay? Uh, okay, so, so we, we took a particle, okay, with L equals zero, dropped it into the system, okay? What happens to it? Well, it, it acquires, it acquires a d phi dt, which is just given by omega, okay? And omega is, is just the, the ratio of these, of these two, uh, of these two uh, uh, metric entries. Okay, okay, so uh, so we drop it down, okay? It, it, it comes down toward, toward the object and it picks up a non-zero d phi dt, okay? So the, so the, uh, the uh, star is spinning this way, okay? And the, the thing comes in and it, it, its frame is dragged around. It picks up a d phi dt, which is, which is non-zero. Okay, which is just given by this formula. So it's a very simple elementary exercise, but it, but it's very it's very compelling. Okay, we saw this with in in gravity magnetism, and the lesson we learned is that inertial frames near a rotating mass rotate with an angular velocity. That's very f surprising. That sounds very odd to us, right? This is a inertial reference frame, 
right? We drop the test particle with no force. It follows the geodesic, okay? That geodesic has d phi dt different from zero, equal, equaling omega, okay? But that's a geodesic. That's an inertial reference frame. So inertial reference frame in this space-time is, is actually rotating. So if uh, if you know about Mach's principle, you uh, you have uh, you have an example of of, of something of, of great interest to the uh, to the cosmologists. Okay, now now consider a rotating rotating black holes. Okay, and uh, and and to get into rotating black holes, let's remember a few things about the black hole we know, the Schwarzschild case. We remember that uh, at the Schwarzschild radius, we had the the time time component of the metric was zero, and the space space component radial space, space space diverged. Okay, and these conditions had two separate uh, implications. One was that we that that we had an infinite redshift. Okay, from our redshift discussion, remember that the the frequency that an observer measures over the frequency of of the emitted uh, photon. So. So I'm in a situation where I'm at fixed position, fixed coordinate, where I emit a, I emit a photon with a frequency nu emit emitter, and then I pick it up at a different r, might be inside or outside that radius, but at a fixed radius, I call that nu sub zero, and then we we uh, we argued that the ratio of these frequencies was the square root of the ratio of the of of the relevant metric components upside down. Okay, and we're going to prove this uh, r rather formally in one of the special topics uh, uh, discussions. We showed this uh, early on, especially in, uh, not so much in the lecture, but uh, where we briefly remarked on it, but w uh, we take some time in the supplementary lecture 11, right before we did uh, Schwarzschild to, uh, to show this. Okay, and so then if we have a situation where this metric, this time-time component of the metric uh, goes to zero for the emitted photon. There was an infinite. There was an infinite redshift. Okay. In other words, <coughs> the uh, uh, as, as as we approach the Schwarzschild radius, the uh, the frequency that's observed very far away from the emitter uh, gets uh, gets uh, 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 gets smaller and smaller. The time delay between the pulses gets larger and larger, and eventually goes to infinity when we sit right on the Schwarzschild radius. So it's called a, uh, a surface of infinite redshift. Now it also corresponded to, to, a, to a surface where the G sub R went to infinity, and this produced an event horizon. We saw that, that, the, uh, uh, that the surface was a null surface. Okay, so particles and light cones could pass through it in one direction only. We saw that, we saw the, that the light cones, okay, as we approach the Schwarzschild radius from outside of it, okay, it's uh, uh, bent over, and once we hit the Schwarzschild radius, the light cone, uh, one of the sides of the light cone was on the Schwarzschild radius, and the other side of the light cone, for incoming and outgoing, was on the other side, was on inside the Schwarzschild radius. So the light cones, the future, the future uh, 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 light cone of any, of any particle, be it either light or massive uh, particle, Bent inside the uh, Schwarzschild radius, okay, and we and we saw that that led to the fact that the particle would necessarily uh, time evolve into into the singularity at uh, at r equals zero and be destroyed, and that nothing could get out of the uh, could get out of the Schwarzschild radius once it once it passed through that one way membrane. Okay, and these were the these are the technical reasons. Uh, Reasons for that. We saw in the case of the Schwarzschild radius, the Schwarzschild case, that these effects occur at at a, at, at one uh, Schwarzschild radius. Now we're going to find for a black hole that that degeneracy is going to be broken, and we'll have separate surfaces of infinite redshift and event horizons, and that will lead to new phenomena, uh, which is which is particularly which is particularly interesting. Okay, okay. So now uh, just to get used to. Uh, some of that phenomena. Let's let's make another Gedanken experiment. Okay, so so for a fixed spatial coordinate, what I want to do is to like take a look at my light cone. Okay, so I'm going to emit a light ray uh, 
in the phi direction, okay? It might be along the phi direction or opposing the phi direction, but let's look at those, let's look at those uh, particular possibilities. So light ray follows a, a null line element, ds squared is equal to zero, okay? And I'm, I'm pointing it in the phi direction, so phi can change. The, the, the bits of the metric that contribute here are phi, d phi, and dt. So this establishes the path for the, uh, for the light ray. Okay, okay. And so I can take this and I can solve for the angular, angular velocity in coordinates, d phi dt, for the light ray. Okay, it's a, it's a quadratic equation for d phi dt, as I see here. Three terms equaling zero, divide through by dt squared. Okay, and just go ahead with it and just solve the quadratic equation. And I see it has a form of minus a ratio plus or minus the square root of the same ratio squared minus dtt over g phi phi. Well, what's interesting here, of course, the most interesting case is to get back to that surface of infinite redshift. Okay, okay, so go, go to gtt. This is generally true, but this special case is particularly illustrative. Choose gtt equal, equal to zero. Okay, this term disappears. This term is, is equal to uh, this term, but with the possibility of addition or subtraction. So I have two solutions. Uh, d phi dt is equal to minus twice gt phi over g phi phi. Looking back at my definitions, I see that that ratio is what I was calling omega, okay, omega of, of, of r and theta, okay? And then in the case where, where I have opposite signs, I get zero. Okay, so that's an amazing, uh, a solution I find a d phi dt equal to zero. Okay, so my so my star is rotating around. I shoot my I shoot my my light ray in the direction of the of the rotation, and I come out with a d phi dt that is twice omega. Okay, twice the natural, the rotating variable for the star uh, that I saw. So the star is dragging the photon with it. Uh, the space time is dragging the photon along, and in this case. Where, where I shoot the where I shoot the, the the light in the opposite direction, the dragging of the star is so intense that it stops the light ray. <laughs> the light ray can't can't uh, go for can't change its phi at all. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's that's an aspect of the surface of of, of infinite uh, redshift, and uh, we'll find one in the Kerr metric, and that'll lead to interesting uh, phenomena as as you, as you can imagine. So that's frame dragging in, the, in its very, in a very intense uh, and interesting, and interesting form. Okay, okay, and that's what uh, that's what I, I I stayed up over here. Okay, well this reminds us of one, one of the phenomena we found with the Schwarzschild metric. Okay, uh, we found in the Schwarzschild metric that stationary motion was not possible inside, inside the event horizon. Okay. So, so, so that's ra rather similar to what we just found in the case of a rotating, of a rotating, rotating star. If we replace the light, the light ray, okay, with a with a massive particle, okay, then the massive particle, uh, if you if you shoot it along the direction of rotation, will get an enhanced d phi dt because of the rotation. And if you shoot it backwards, okay, well it's not going to keep up with the with the light ray that stopped, okay, in in that case. So, so the massive particle will also always uh, rotate with the rotating star on the surface of infinite redshift. Okay, so it can't stand still. It's impossible for it to stand still, no matter what, no matter what you try. Okay, okay. So, uh, so that's interesting, and it reminds us uh, then of the fact that in in the Schwarzschild metric inside the event horizon. Stationary motion is not possible, and let's remember how that goes. Here's a particularly simple way of saying it. So I imagine a particle at rest. Okay, so u is just u t. Okay, but the, but the norm of u is just c squared. Write out the norm. Okay, it's just g t t u t quantity squared equals c squared. Okay, but inside the event horizon, g t t is negative. We have a contradiction. Stationary motion is not is not uh, possible there, and of course that's just a, just related to the fact that uh, one that we've already un understood 
uh, you know, that uh, time-like intervals and space-like intervals inside the event horizon are switched. Okay, and we saw how important that was uh, for the character of the motion inside the event horizon and, and was related to the fact that uh, particles can never escape from inside the event horizon. Okay, so now I've warmed you up to some of the remarkable uh, features of uh, rotating stars and the metric around rotating stars. Let's take a look at the exact solution, okay, of the metric in that situation, the Kerr metric, and we'll discuss rotating stars, and then we'll also discuss the, the situation where those stars might have collapsed to a small enough radius that the radius is inside the event horizons of the Kerr metric, and we have a black hole. Okay, on to that next.